How do you include subcontractor costs in your construction estimates? Anybody with estimating experience knows that this is much more challenging than it initially seems. Why is that? Because subcontractors, when we're pricing jobs, often don't want to put in the time and attention that a proper estimate warrants because they know it's not a real project. That's why one of the hardest things to do is to work out what allowances you should make in your construction estimates to ensure that when it comes to project delivery, there's enough money in the budget. And getting this wrong, believe me, is an absolutely horrible feeling when it comes to project delivery and people find out there's not enough money in the budget. So that's why in this video, I'm just gonna lay out a simple process you can follow and adopt to make sure your allowances for subcontractor costs that you're including in your estimates are spot on. So where does subcontractor cost fit into the overall picture of a construction estimate? Well, could subcontractor costs form a part of our direct costs? So these are the portion of the project scope that we choose to outsource to other suppliers or subcontractors. So an example of a subcontract cost might be an earthworks contractor for a new building. So these are the packages of works we're outsourcing to the market. The goal of accurately estimating subcontractor costs is basically to form and include a bucket of money in our construction estimates that we can use later down the track when we're delivering the project to procure a subcontractor who can deliver that work for us. And subcontractor estimating is also more important because often we need to engage with subcontractors to help develop our own methodology and our own schedule when we're preparing a tender submission. So there's quite a holistic engagement we have to do with subcontractors. I've messed this up pretty badly on a project I was working on. So as we go through the video, I'm gonna talk about all the things that I did wrong so you can hopefully avoid the same mistakes. Estimating subcontractor costs has some unique and specific challenges that we don't face when we're estimating labor costs, plant costs, material costs. So the first one of these is price validity. So what this means is that during a tender period, we'll be submitting a quote to our own client to deliver the project. And often we'll have to maintain some validity with our pricing for 30, 60, 90 days. Then they award the contract. Then we might go into some initial design project setup phase, and then we'll be doing procurement. So what this means is we'll be getting quotes for a subcontract portion of our project scope, maybe three to four months before we would actually be awarding that subcontract. What that means is that almost certainly the quote we've gotten from the market to do the work won't be valid by the time we go and need to procure it. So basically, we're going to have to get things repriced because of a variety of factors, market conditions, changes to scope. It's very likely the price we get back will be different. So that's the first challenge with accurately estimating subcontract costs. So how do we deal with these changing prices over time? The second challenge we face is transparency. One of the reasons we're in the first place we're choosing to outsource the works is because we believe another company can do it better for us. So whether that's purchasing complicated electrical plant, engaging an earthwork subcontractor, whatever the package is, we're choosing to outsource it because we believe another company can do it better than us. And what this means for us is that the other people know more about it and we're lacking in our understanding of that project scope. And obviously, if we don't understand the project scope, we don't understand the methodology, it makes it hard for us to price it, to validate the pricing, and to understand all the intricacies of the methodology that could impact our estimate. So that's why we have this issue of transparency with subcontractor quotes. We don't actually understand how the price is built up. The next challenge is level of effort and engagement from subcontractors. What this means is, say we're quoting to do a project to a client. We might be one of three, one of four, one of five potential bidders. Then if we want to go to get quotes from a subcontractor, they know it's not a real project. They know there's only a one in three chance, at best, that the project goes ahead. Because of that, they're not going to put in the effort that they would a real project. They know that we're not going to be in a position to award a contract for a couple of months. They know they're going to have another chance at pricing it. They don't want to spend 30, 40, 50 hours going through the drawings and coming up with an accurate price. So they'll probably just prepare a rough order of magnitude budget price. And that means the accuracy of the pricing is going to be a bit hit and miss. They might miss specific details that have a significant impact on the project costs, or their costs might be over the top and inflated. 
The other major challenge with estimating subcontractor costs that I regularly see is that because we often have a short tender period, we don't have the time and resources available to go through a proper procurement process, prepare all the drawings. We might not even have all the drawings. Write a scope of works, prepare a bill of quantities, and do all the due diligence and effort we would do during a normal procurement process. And on top of that, we've probably only got a couple of weeks for the subcontractors to price the projects themselves. That's why we'll go through this rushed budget pricing process and ultimately not complete the procurement process properly. And this is also going to lead to risks and uncertainty in our subcontractor pricing. Just quickly, my name is Tim and I run a website called Construct IQ with a ton of free construction management training courses. We've got a four hour course on construction estimating. If you want to learn the basics, I'll put a link in the description. Feel free to check it out. And from now, I'm going to go through the process to accurately estimate subcontract costs. So we know the challenges. Now I'm going to go through the process you can use to hopefully best overcome these challenges. So what's the best ideal way to estimate subcontract costs? In a perfect world, we'd have an extended tender duration, we'd have perfect information during the tender phase, and in this case, what we should be doing is we want to get quotes from the market that have a back-to-back -back validity with our offer. What this means is while we're doing procurement, we get firm lump sum pricing, we get a tender validity period which matches our tender validity period, then when the client awards us the contract, we also negotiate and award the subcontracts on the first day of contract award. So this means the allowance we include in the estimate is the contract value for our subcontractor and the second we're awarded the head contract, we also award the subcontract. So that's the perfect situation and what we should be striving for back to back head contracts and subcontracts. But I understand this isn't always going to be possible. In the real world, we're likely going to be rushed and we're not going to have perfect information, but we should still follow the same process throughout our tender period. What we want to first do is we want to develop a procurement approach. We want to break the project scope down into pieces, understand what all the packages are and prepare a procurement schedule. Second thing we want to do for each of these packages with the information we have available at tender to prepare a tender package, a set of drawings, a scope of works and a bill of quantities. Then we want to send these quotes out and get quotes from the market. Then the final step, which I think is the most important step, is to review these quotes in detail, do a gap analysis and level them. Make sure we understand what's included in each quote and we're covering ourselves for any gaps. So this means we need to have a good understanding of the actual work the subcontractor is doing. I was working on the tender for a large industrial project. And it was my responsibility to get valid quotes from the market for all of the key subcontract packages. Now, one of these packages was a large bulk earthworks scope and so all the bulk earthworks, the concreting, the drainage, these sorts of things. And it formed a very significant portion of the total project costs. The company I was working for was desperate to win the bid and to make matters worse, we had a very short tender duration. So I'm going to talk about all the things I did wrong in this process so you hopefully don't repeat the same mistakes. The first step of accurately including subcontractor costs in your estimates is to develop a procurement approach. So a procurement approach documents what packages we need to procure, what we're going to sell form, what we're choosing to outsource, and then an outline of each of these packages. So when we've developed the procurement approach, we'll know we need an earthworks contractor, we need an electrical contractor, we need a mechanical contractor. We're going to be ordering certain materials and free issuing them to a subcontractor. So basically outlines the project scope and how we're choosing to break it up. The key document you're going to be preparing to capture this is the work breakdown structure or procurement schedule. So this is a hierarchical decomposition of the project scope into a list of separate packages. And basically each of these packages, when you combine them together, is going to cover the overall project scope. So you'll document this in a work breakdown structure and then also a procurement schedule. As an example of a procurement schedule for a electrical upgrade of a road, we'd have street lighting civil works, supply of light poles, crane services, supply of distribution boards, and an electrical contractor. We also want to make sure these are covered in a procurement schedule because we also want to 
define the packages, but also work out when we would need to procure these services. And this is more important when we're talking about integrating procurement into the project schedule and methodology. This process on my project, I actually did a pretty good job of. I developed a procurement schedule, I listed out all the packages and I got buy-in from the project team. Although the buy-in I got was probably a bit superficial. I only realized that in retrospect that I probably didn't properly highlight exactly what the scopes of the packages were and which suppliers and subcontractors we were planning on getting quotes from. The next step in the process is for each of these packages to go through and prepare a tender package. So this is a set of documents and drawings that define exactly what, what we want a potential subcontractor to do. So there'll be a scope of works that says we want an earthwork subcontractor to perform bulk earthworks, drainage, concreting, and so on and so forth. We'll also attach a set of drawings to this. So the drawings that define what they're actually going to be building and also, and ideally, a bill of quantities. So we can clearly benchmark all the pricing between the different subcontractors. My opinion is when you're doing subcontractor estimating during the tender phase, you should submit subcontractors a bill of quantities because in practice, you're not going to be able to sign them up to a lump sum subcontract. And if you do the bill of quantities, you'll make sure, make sure subcontractors don't have any mistakes in their quantity takeoffs and leveling the bids is much easier later on. When you're trying to work out what information should go in a tender package, the framework you need to adopt is what information would you need to have access to to accurately price it yourself? And this is the best framework I can think of when preparing a procurement package because at the end of the day, that's the question and that's the information they need answered. You need to provide them all the documents and information that impact their pricing but you don't want to send them a whole lot of irrelevant and useless documentation. For example, if you're procuring an electrical subcontractor that's doing no digging, don't send them the geotechnical specification. You want to make things as easy as possible for them and not to bombard them with a whole lot of unnecessary and irrelevant information. The other thing that's really important to do in this stage of the project is to define when you need the quotes by. If you have a short tender period, they might only have a week to price the job. So that's why you want to engage with the supply chain early, tell them when the package is coming out, give them an outline of the scope, call them to follow up and explain what this work specific works are going to be and what's going to be in the tender package so you can get quotes back from them as quickly and accurately as possible. This is where it started to go wrong on my project. The first issue we had was we had a really, really short tender period. We only had a couple of weeks to prepare a massive tender submission. Furthermore, we didn't have accurate design details. We didn't have a bill of quantities. We were missing all this information and it was getting drip fed to us as the tender period was progressing. The first mistake I made was I sent the tender package out too early. I didn't wait to get all the information together and as more information became available, I kept drip feeding this to subcontractors. It frustrated them, it confused them and ultimately it made leveling the bids later on more confusing because everyone was working off different bits of information. Once you've prepared your tender package, the next step in the process is to send it out to pre-qualified subcontractors. So these are subcontractors we could actually engage to complete the project for us. So this means they meet our safety standards, they meet our quality standards, they have all the necessary licenses and accreditation. So we want to send them out to as many of these subcontractors as possible, ideally between three to five. Now you can't send it to too many because with each person you send it to, you're going to have to answer questions, you're going to go to meetings. So there is some overhead and time required to manage these packages. That's why I recommend the sweet spot is between three to five subcontractors because that'll ensure you get enough quotes to know that the pricing you're receiving is accurate because they should all sit around the same sort of mark. Then you need to manage the subcontractors while they price it. You want to be calling them. You want to be talking to them. You want to be understanding what they're doing. You want to be feeding them the correct information. As new information becomes available, you want to be issuing it to them and updating the tender package with addendums. And as I said, this is the part I completely stuffed up. I sent the package out way too early and then I was drip feeding them information and confusing them. Once we get the quotes back from the market, the first thing we want to do is we want to verify that they're correct. That means we're going to do a review of the pricing, make sure they've priced everything and make sure the allowances they've made seem to be correct. When people have excluded things, they'll usually document this in their letter of offer. Where there's gaps in their pricing, we can either send it back to them and ask them to update their pricing to include it or we can make 
some sort of first principles allowance for ourselves. So this is this is called a gap analysis. And so basically we include anything they've missed in their tender. The next thing we want to do is we want to get all the quotes we've received and compare them side by side. We basically want to go through line by line, look at everyone's rates and make sure they're all about the same. Ideally, we should get three quotes that are pretty much between plus or minus 5% from each other. If we got three quotes back that were almost exactly the same, we'd be very confident as to the true costs of doing the work. However, if they're vastly different, that's where we're going to really have to start investigating why this is so. Have people priced the same stuff? Have people misinterpreted scope? Have certain things been missed? And so when you start to get multiple quotes back that are varying, that are significantly different, that's when the alarm bells start going off. That's when people start to get concerned that we don't actually understand how much these works are going to cost us to do Ideally, we can investigate and resolve these differences. However, if there's still got multiple quotes that are varyingly different, which one should we include in our estimate? Well, the short answer to that is not the cheapest. If we've got a nut, oh, say we've got three quotes and one of them is vastly cheap than the others, we definitely do not base our pricing on the cheapest quote because it's likely they've missed something, they've calculated something wrong. And when we come to actually procure these services later on down the track and sign a contract, we'll almost certainly find that their price that they submitted is no longer valid. So we should Ideally, level the three quotes. Hopefully, they're about the same and we take the average. Or if we've got two quotes of the same and one's much lower, we should take the average of two quotes that are roughly the same. Point here is don't take the cheapest quote because you'll find when you come to deliver the project, the pricing they've provided won't be valid and you'll be in the red when procuring that package. So what happened on my project? Well, basically I only went to three subcontractors. I confused all of them with the unnecessary information. One of them pulled out and we got two quotes that were completely different. We didn't know what to include in our estimate. My management weren't super happy with me and we ended up just simply taking the higher price and on top of that, adding an additional fudge factor, which in a really competitive industry like the construction industry, if we're just grossly overpricing works, we're not going to be competitive and it's going to decrease the chances that we win projects. So that's why estimating is such a critical skill because it ultimately drives how likely you are to secure more profitable projects. Hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you got something out of it and I've been posting a ton of content on construction estimating so I'd love if you could go and check out some of the videos and see if you like them. Thanks for watching.